Madam President, tomorrow we will be voting on the two impeachment articles sent over to us by the House of Representatives, a process that, as the leader pointed out, really started from the very day this president took office. I will be voting to acquit the president for several reasons. First and foremost, I do not believe that the facts in this case rise to the high bar that the founders set for removal from office. The founders imposed a threshold for impeachment of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. In other words, very serious violations of the public trust. The founders were deliberate in their choice of words. They wanted to be clear that impeachment was a severe remedy to be deployed only for very serious violations. When George Mason proposed adding the term maladministration to the impeachment clause during the Constitutional Convention, the framers rejected the proposal because, as Madison pointed out, the term was too vague and would be equivalent to a tenure during pleasure of the Senate. The founders recognized that without safeguards, impeachment could quickly degenerate into a political weapon to be used to overturn elections when one faction or another decided that it didn't like the president. That's why the founders split the impeachment power, giving the House the sole authority to impeach, impeach and the Senate the sole authority to try impeachments. And as a final check, the founders required a two-thirds supermajority vote in the Senate to remove a president from office. All of these things, Madam President, show just how seriously the founders regarded removing a duly elected president. They intended it as an extreme remedy to be used only in very grave circumstances. And I do not believe that the charges the House has leveled against the president meet that high bar. The House manager's presentation, which stretched over 22 hours, included testimony from more than a dozen witnesses. We also heard from the House managers during more than 16 hours of questions from senators, in all about 180 questions. And we received more than 28,000 pages of testimony, evidence, and arguments from the House of Representatives. I considered all the evidence carefully, but ultimately I concluded that the two charges presented by the House managers, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress, did not provide a compelling case for removing this president. According to public reporting, House Democrats toyed with charging the president with bribery, believing that it polled well, but they didn't have the evidence to prove that charge or indeed to prove any actual crime. While allegations of specific criminal conduct may not be constitutionally required, they anchor impeachment in the law and their absence is telling. Lacking evidence of a specific crime, the House decided to use the shotgun approach and throw everything under the catch-all abuse of power umbrella. Abuse of power, Madam President, is vaguely defined and subject to interpretation. In fact, I don't believe there has been a president in my lifetime who hasn't been accused of some form of abuse of power. For that reason, abuse of power seemed to me a fairly weak predicate on which to remove a democratically elected president from office. During the Clinton impeachment, I voted against the abuse of power article precisely because I believed it did not offer strong grounds for removing the duly elected president. With respect to the second article, obstruction of Congress, the House took issue with the president's assertion of legal privileges, including those rooted in the constitutional separation of powers. Of course, every president in recent memory has invoked such privileges. For example, when the Obama administration cited executive privilege to deny documents to Congress during the fast and furious gun running investigation. The House could have challenged the president's privilege claims by going through the traditional channel to resolve disputes between the executive and, le and legislative branches, that being of course, the courts. That's what was done in previous impeachment inquiries like the Clinton impeachment. But the House skipped that step, Madam President, in hopes that the Senate would bail them out and compel testimony and documents that the House in its rush to impeachment was one unwilling to procure. Again, this seemed like a very thin basis on which to remove a duly elected president from office. The facts of the case are that aid to Ukraine was released prior to the end of the fiscal year. And no investigation of the scandal-plagued firm Burisma or the Bidens was ever initiated. While we can debate the president's judgment when it comes to his dealings with Ukraine, or even conclude that his actions were inappropriate, the House's vague and overreaching impeachment charges do not meet the high bar set by the founders for removal from office. My second consideration, Madam President, in voting to acquit the president is the deeply partisan nature of the House's impeachment proceedings. The founders' overriding concern about impeachment was that partisan majorities could use impeachment as a political weapon. In Federalist 65, Alexander Hamilton speaks of the danger of impeachment being used by, and I quote, an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives, end quote. 
by limiting the House's power to impeaching the president and not to removing him from office, the founders hoped that the Senate would act as a check on any attempt by the House to use the power of impeachment for partisan purposes. Unfortunately, the founders' concerns about partisanship were realized in this impeachment process. For the first time in modern history, impeachment was initiated and conducted on a purely partisan basis. While the Nixon impeachment proceedings in the House are held up as an example of bipartisanship, even the impeachment of President Clinton was initiated with the support of more than 30 Democrats. By contrast, in this case, House and Democrats drove ahead in a completely, completely partisan exercise. Then they rushed through the impeachment process at breakneck speed, rejecting a thorough investigation because they wanted to impeach the president as fast as possible. And then they expected the Senate to take on the House's investigative responsibility. Madam President, House Democrats paid lip service to the idea that they regretted having to impeach the president, but their actions told a different story. The Speaker of the House, the Speaker distributed celebratory pens when she signed the articles of impeachment and then went on TV and celebrated the impeachment with a fist bump. Madam President, it doesn't require much work to imagine the damage that can be done to our republic if impeachment becomes a weapon to be used whenever a political party doesn't like a president. Pretty soon, presidents would be serving not at the pleasure of the American people, but at the pleasure of the House and the Senate. We need to call a halt before we've gone too far to turn back. Endorsing the House's rushed, partisan, and slipshod work would encourage future houses to use impeachment for partisan purposes. Both parties need to learn that partisan impeachments are perilous. Finally, Madam President, I believe that except in the most extreme circumstances, it should be the American people and not Washington politicians who decide whether or not a president should be removed from office. Presidential primary voting, as we learned yesterday in Iowa, is already underway. We have a presidential election in November where the people of this country can weigh in and make their voices heard. I think we should leave the decision up to them. Indeed, given the deep divisions plaguing our country as reflected in the starkly different views about this impeachment, removing the president from office and, and from the ballots for the upcoming election would almost certainly plunge the country into even greater political turmoil. Madam President, I am deeply troubled by the events of the past few months. I've always believed that we can differ here in Congress while still respecting and working with those who disagree with us. But Democrats have increasingly sought to demonize anyone who doesn't share their obsession with impeaching this president. One of the House managers in this trial went so far as to suggest that any senator who voted against them was treacherous. And at one point, a senator asked whether the chief justice's constitutionally required participation in the trial was contributing to, quote, the loss of legitimacy of the chief justice, the Supreme Court, and the Constitution, end quote with a clear suggestion that the only way for the Supreme Court to maintain its legitimacy would be for it to agree with the Democratic Party. We've sunk pretty low when we've come to the point of suggesting that disagreement is unconstitutional. But for all this, Madam President, I remain hopeful. Congress has been through contentious times before, and we've gotten through them. There's no question that this partisan impeachment has been divisive. But I do believe we can move on from this. And I am ready to work with all all of my colleagues, both Democrat and Republican, in the coming weeks and months as we get back to the business of the American people. And for the nation that we all love, I pray that that proves possible.